All right, I think we'll begin. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Matthew Continetti, the Patrick and Charlene Neal Chair in American Prosperity here at the American Enterprise Institute, where I'll, I also serve as Director of Domestic Policy Studies. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this morning's discussion of Defining Deviancy Down at 30, Reflections on Crime, Welfare, and Mental Health. In just a few moments, some of this nation's leading experts on social policy will comment on the legacy of a seminal essay by a remarkable man who continues, 20 years after his passing, to inspire not only me, but I am sure many of you gathered in this room and watching online. I refer, of course, to Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who served as a Democratic senator from New York between 1976 and 2000. He was born on March 16, 1927, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but after the disappearance of his father, Moynihan spent years living in poverty as a child in Hell's Kitchen, New York City, where, among other tasks, he shined shoes and worked at his mother's bar. Biography is not destiny, but I think we can detect in Moynihan's formative experiences some of the themes of his later intellectual and political life. The relationship between family structure and poverty, the importance of work and gainful employment, the persistence of ethnicity, the need for safe, habitable, and beautiful urban environments, and also, yes, the need for a government safety net. Moynihan explored these subjects and a host of others in reports, essays, and books that he wrote as an academic, as an official in four presidential administrations, two Republicans, two Democrats, and as an elected official. Today is devoted to just one of Moynihan's landmark publications, an essay that appeared in the summer 1993 issue of The American Scholar. His argument three decades ago was simple. I quote, the amount of deviant behavior in American society has increased beyond the levels the community can afford to recognize, he wrote, and that accordingly we have been redefining deviancy so as to exempt much conduct previously stigmatized and also quietly raising the normal level in categories where behavior is now abnormal by any earlier standard, close quote. Moynihan saw this redefinition taking place in several areas, specifically mental health, family structure, and criminology, all of which will come up in today's discussion. I urge anyone who may be watching and who might be unfamiliar with the life of this extraordinary public servant to visit the Daniel Patrick Moynihan page at www.contemporarythinkers.org where you will find a biography as well as links to interviews and articles. And now a brief note on the run of show today. After remarks from Glenn Lowry, Stephen Tellis of Johns Hopkins will take the stage. He's already there, in fact, so we're running on schedule, and introduce the remaining speakers. Stephen will then lead our discussion, leaving time, we hope, for audience questions, and he will explain um, how we will take those questions. Professor Tellis teaches political science at Johns Hopkins University, and he's also a senior fellow at the Niskanen Center. He's published widely in outlets from national affairs to the public interest, the American prospect, and the nation. His most recent book, co-authored with Robert P. Seldon, is Never Trump, The Revolt of the Conservative Elites. And now it's also my privilege to introduce Glenn Lowry. Dr. Lowry is the Paulson Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and the Merton P. Stoltz Professor of Economics at Brown University. As a professional economist, Dr. Lowry has published in areas from applied macro, microeconomic theory to the economics of race and inequality. A recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Carnegie Scholarship, Dr. Lowry has been elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a member of the American Philosophical Society, and vice president of the American Economics Association. He is, of course, a prominent social critic and public intellectual, focusing primarily on racial inequality and social policy. He's published more than 200 essays and reviews and journals, and his long anticipated memoir, Late Admissions, Confessions of a Black Conservative, will be published in the spring of 2024. Professor Lowry, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Matthew. Let me find my 
Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to have been asked to deliver some remarks on this occasion. Let's take a walk down memory lane. Perhaps the primordial example of defining deviancy down was the furious reaction to Pat Moynihan's infamous 1965 policy memorandum, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. That memo declared that the United States was approaching, quote, a new crisis in race relations. It explained that, quote, a national effort is required directed to a new kind of national goal, the establishment of a stable Negro family structure, close quote, close quote. Viewed from today's perspective, one can see the problem immediately. Just as President Johnson was launching his war on poverty, along comes a government official boldly stating that the expectation for racial equality would likely be disappointed, not merely due to anti-Black racism, but mainly because the fabric of social life amongst poor Blacks lay in tatters. For many at the time, this kind of talk was simply unacceptable. And for many on the left of American politics today, it remains so. How dare a white man say these things? What will happen to reform if studies like this are issued with the imprimatur of the federal government. The author, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, then a young assistant secretary at the US Department of Labor, had to be made an example of, and so he was. A firestorm of protests from journalists and civil rights activists greeted the public release of his policy document. A precedent was thereby set the themes of which will be all too familiar to us today. By calling attention to the instability of family life in poor black communities, Moynihan was said to downplay the importance of racial discrimination. By ascribing this trend in part to cultural factors, he was said to be blaming the victim. By rehearsing the arguments of such distinguished black sociologists as Du Bois and E. Franklin Frazier, arguments that chattel slavery had undermined gender relations amongst the slaves with consequences reaching into the 20th century, Moynihan was said to be a flat out racist. Moreover, in what we will recognize in retrospect as an episode of political correctness run amok, productive discussion of, quote, the Negro family became impossible to sustain. This was the 1960s after all. Civil rights victories over implacable Southern opposition were fresh in everyone's mind. Cities were burning during a series of long, hot summers. And in Tonier precincts, radical chic had become the fashion of the day. Advocacy in defense of traditional values was in bad order amongst progressives. The moral authority of traditional norms about social behavior was under assault while the moral authority of racism's victims was virtually unquestioned. Nothing, it was said, is inherently good about two-parent families and nothing inherently bad about single motherhood. Deviancy was defined down. Calling attention to the weakness of black family life was said to be a distraction from shifted focus, a distraction that shifted focus from what's wrong with America to what's wrong with black people. Moynihan, a dyed-in-the-wool liberal Democrat whose principal policy recommendation in that report was to expand public employment for black men, became for many the personification of anti-black sentiments dressed up with a Harvard pedigree. There was only one problem with all of this. Pat Moynihan was mostly right about the Negro family in 1965, both in his diagnosis of his condition and in his forecasts of the likely implications. Looking across the social landscape today, nearly 60 years after his dire warning, we can see the plain fact that conventional family relationships in the black urban ghettos have collapsed. What is more, nothing approaching social inclusion for the lower classes of uh, the black American population has been or soon will be achieved. More speculative, but still entirely plausible is the conclusion that these two undeniable facts are closely linked with the former 
being a primary reason for the latter. Defining deviancy down comes at a price, and that price is being paid mainly by the deviant, not by the definers. But in 1965 and subsequently, critics were much more interested in what they supposed to be Pat Moynihan's motives than in the acuity of his analysis. Fast and furiously came the accusations of ill will. A period ensued that lasted for decades during which little critical assessment of black family life was undertaken and no policy response was fashioned. The story is by now a familiar one, even to the casual student of American social policy, to wit, any discussion of the internal cultural dynamics that might underlie black poverty in America must be left to those with racial standing to talk about such matters. Failing that, such discussion must be avoided altogether. Precious few of us with that standing to address such matters have elected to do so. The fiercely negative reactions to Moynihan's report were a brand of intellectual thuggery that would become all too familiar in due course. Smug in their certitude, the fuck police and the universities, the government, the editorial pages, and the foundation boardrooms managed, in effect, to censor public discourse on crime, affirmative action, school desegregation, urban renewal, welfare policy, and much more. These thought police were emboldened. It even became dangerous to celebrate the success of the civil rights revolution by noticing the emergence of a new black middle class. The signature tactic was to accuse the politically incorrect of being racist. The willingness to entertain certain hypotheses that forced busing could cause white flight, that proliferating criminal violence amongst blacks might retard urban development, that affirmative action compromised academic standards and stigmatized its beneficiaries, that stable families are a necessary precondition for human flourishing. All of this came to be seen as evidence of a lack of fidelity to progressive values. Reliance on ad hominem argument grew more commonplace. What kind of person would say such a thing became the progressive's first question. The list of unsavory characters lengthened. To Moynihan's name were added those of Edward Banfield for his reflections on urban decline, of James Q. Wilson for worrying about rising crime rates, of Nathan Glazer for noticing some of the downsides of racial affirmative action, to James S. Coleman for exposing the limits of school desegregation, to Charles Murray for suggesting that welfare could create dependency amongst long-term recipients, to Abigail Thernstrom for questioning racial gerrymandering. I'm not saying that these critics were correct in every detail, but I am saying that like Moynihan, all of these critics made cogent and important arguments that were rooted in astute observations and they deserve to be taken more seriously than they were. Moreover, all of these critics have in one way or another, and to varying degrees, been vindicated by subsequent events. Here's the key point. The furiously negative reaction to Moynihan's report, the subsequent suppression of the issue of family structure and interpersonal behavior amongst the poor, the reticence to invoke norms of civility, decency, and respectability in our public discussions of the plight of the disadvantaged. All of these developments proved to be a disaster, both politically and sociologically, for the newly liberated black masses, reflecting what must be seen in retrospect as one of the great failures of the last half century of American social politics. In my view, the black poor had paid a terrible price for this folly. Not that Moynihan was right in every detail or that he was above criticism or without foibles and vanities, but he was right about the big questions. And contrary to the allegations of his critics, his values were progressive to the core. It must be said that Banfield, Coleman, Wilson, Thernstrom, Murray, Glazer and others, this list could be considerably lengthened, were equally right about some of the larger themes of the late 20th century American social policy debate. 
about negative unintended consequences from progressive social interventions, about limits of liberal reform to create genuine equality, about the importance of social order and about the irreplaceable role in maintaining it of the traditional institutions of civil society. Events have consistently borne them out. We shall overcome. That was the anthem of the civil rights movement. And yet, with a third of black children now living in poverty, with nearly a million black men under lock and key on a given day, with an average deficit of three years in acquired reading skills for black youngsters relative to white by the end of adolescence, with nearly three out of every four black babies being born to an unwed mother, with hardcore ghettos in Detroit and Chicago and Philadelphia and Oakland and St. Louis and Houston and New Orleans and Baltimore and on and on ad nauseum, and dozens of other American cities continuing to fester in their marginality and their hopelessness with all of this wreckage so readily at hand, it is clear that we black Americans have not yet overcome, not by a long shot, and we never will, so long as we insist on continuing to define deviancy down. Thank you. All right, well, uh, can everyone hear me? Um, so I'm called upon just to be the, uh, the chair of this uh, and therefore to be scrupulously neutral. Uh, but I will, before I introduce the panelists, just say this is my second panel in, uh, I think, four days where I'm supposed to be reflecting on older, sort of neo Connie pieces. So on, on Friday or Thursday, I was on a panel at Pepperdine on, um, uh, on Kelling and, uh, and, uh, and Wilson's uh, Broken Windows essay. And so I've had occasion to reread these pieces from, uh, that are in some sense pieces from my youth that were really influential on me. And I will say, really reading these pieces, so again, the other thing is I was trained as a Straussian, so I was trained to do close reading of text. And in retrospect, these are very weird essays, um, and Neil may, may agree with me on this. I'm not saying they're bad, but they're different than the kind of things that people would write today. Uh, one thing I'll just say as, an, as a, by way of introduction is they're much more sociological, right? They're engaged with classic works of sociological theory. We may disagree with how well they engage with them or how appropriately they do, but they came out of an era in which conservatism was more sociological um, and engaged with sociological theory, and that's worth, I think, reflecting uh, on a little bit. And it also came in an era in which conservatives loomed much larger in the academy, right, um, than they do today. Okay, so I will, I'll go ahead and do my introduction to the panelists. Uh, all right, we have a distinguished panel. Um, which sometimes people say when it's not a distinguished panel, but today is an actual distinguished panel um, with uh, my old friend Sally Sattel, who is a senior fellow at AI, um, a psychiatrist, and the medical director of a local methadone clinic. Um, Neil Gross, also my friend, is the Charles A. Dana Professor of Sociology, uh, Chair of the Social Sciences Division at um, Colby College. He works primarily on policing, politics, sociological theory, and the sociology of intellectual life. He's authored uh, several books, including one that's had a huge influence on me on why uh, professors are liberal and why conservatives care, and he's published in a wide range of other popular outlets. Um, Kay Heimowitz is the William E. Simon. Everybody has like an endowed chair here. Um, uh, William E. Simon Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of City Journal. She's the author of several books and has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and other outlets. Her work centers on childhood, family issues, poverty, and cultural change in America. Um, do we have a preference on ordering, or do you want to start? We'll start with, we'll start with Neil. Sure, I'm going to speak from up there. Okay, yeah, good. Thanks. You can speak wherever you want. Thanks, good morning. Uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, Sally Sattel and AEI for inviting me here today and providing uh, an opportunity to think anew about defining deviancy down. 
Uh, I first encountered Moynihan's piece about 25 years ago as a graduate student in sociology, not long after it came out. Um, it's not a scholarly contribution, but as Moynihan bases his argument in part on the work of Emile Durkheim, one of the key figures in the history of sociology, and on the sociologist Kai Erickson's important study, Wayward Puritans, which covers the Salem witch trials, among other topics, the essay began circulating pretty quickly um, in uh, the discipline. It's a testament to Moynihan's talents that he was able to synthesize sociological theories uh, with social trends from his day to come up with such a memorable description of what he saw unfolding around him. Uh, his idea that America was busy defining deviancy down to bad effect, that he, that he made this contribution during his free time while serving in the Senate is all the more remarkable, though hardly uncharacteristic of a man who made his career straddling the fields of politics and academia. So our charge today, as I understood it, uh, is to consider how well Moynihan's thesis holds up. And I'll take up two aspects of this. First, and most fundamentally, does it make sense? Does it cohere logically? Is it plausible? Does the evidence Moynihan adduces support his claim? And second, can defining deviancy down help us understand any current developments in the area of crime and criminal justice? Uh, now, uh, Matthew uh, briefly summarized the, uh, the um, argument before and quoted from Moynihan. I'm gonna do so again because there's uh, an aspect of the, the thesis that I'm gonna really focus in on, and that's the set of causal arguments that Moynihan wants to make. Again, over the past generation, he said, the amount of deviant behavior has been uh, increased beyond the levels communities can afford to recognize, and accordingly, we have been redefining deviancy down. And Moynihan went on to name three forms that this redefining could take, what he termed altruistic, opportunistic, and normalizing, illustrating the first with the deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill, the second with the growth of single motherhood and the failure of various forces to combat it, and the third with rising rates of violent crime. So let's start with the first question. Does this argument make sense? Moynihan's notion that there's an upper limit on the amount of deviance a society can afford to recognize is taken from Erickson, who saw that limit as determined by, quote, the size and complexity of a society's social control apparatus. In Erickson's example, Puritan society couldn't afford to recognize more deviance, witches, for example, than there were, as Moynihan put it, stocks and whipping posts. If the size and complexity of the social control apparatus remains relatively constant, with bo which both Erickson and Moynihan thought it tended to, then in principle, the amount of socially recognized deviance should remain constant as well, creating strain when the actual deviance uh, uh, exceeds that limit. One problem here, I think, is that there's a difference between recognizing and punishing, a difference that both uh, Erickson and Moynihan largely ignore. Given a fixed supply of stocks and whipping posts, the Puritans could only punish so many witches, but they could recognize a far greater number of witches than that in the sense of identifying and tallying people whose behavior met their criteria for witchcraft. When you dig into Moynihan's examples, it becomes clear that they're far more about punishment than recognition per se. We may not have had enough cops in the 80s and early 90s to investigate and arrest everyone who'd committed an offense, as Moynihan suggests, but we certainly recognized how much crime there was because of official crime reports, journalistic stories, and the like, sources from which Moynihan freely draws. Similarly, while key institutions may not have pivoted to sanction and discourage single motherhood, Policymakers and social scientists, including Moynihan, certainly had good data on family trends. They recognized how much of a change in family structure was occurring. This distinction between punishment and recognition isn't merely semantic. Because the institutions that recognize deviance, in modern societies anyway, go well beyond institutions of formal social control, to include statistical bureaus run by the state, the social scientific and medical communities, the press, and so on, such societies can typically recognize a great deal more deviance than they can punish. If punishment and recognition were the same thing, and deviance wasn't apparent to members of society, absent sufficient capacity to punishment, then sure, maybe the latter uh, would determine the limit of the former. But if, in the more usual case, a society can recognize deviance, even if it lacks the capacity to punish all of it, why should that necessarily lead to a change in what's considered deviant? 
Isn't it also common in such situations for societies to increase their investments in punishment, as the US did in the uh, mid-1990s by hiring many more police officers and building new prisons so that the size of the social control apparatus doesn't remain constant? Or alternatively, to allow the gap between the amount of deviance recognized versus punished to become institutionalized? We've known for years, for example, that many people cheat on their taxes and that the IRS doesn't have sufficient personnel to combat tax fraud. But instead of socially redefining tax fraud as a non-deviant activity, we've simply grown accustomed to the gap and regularly bemoan the fact that the government is losing out on revenue. Now, I can see why the social order might come under strain, uh, under pressure, if the gap between total deviance and the capacity for punishment were perceived to be too large. But another common result of this, in democracies anyway, is for the political party or parties not in power to blame that gap on their opponents and seize the political advantage, a strategy that requires that deviancy not be defined down. Republicans could hardly blame Democrats for ostensibly out of control crime rates uh, without presuming that most voters continue to think of crime as a problem. The other thing I'd note is that two of the examples Moynihan gives in the paper don't match up very well with his theory. So to my mind, they don't do much to establish its plausibility. Most glaringly, on the account he gives, the deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill happened not because there was an increase in the number of mentally ill beyond the capacity of American society to control it, but because of a combination of pharmacological innovations, philosophical shifts in psychiatry, and patients' rights activism that led the mental health community to favor a turn toward community-based treatment. And I understand that Sally will discuss this in more detail in her presentation. In the case of single parenthood, his example of an opportunistic path to defining deviancy down, he advances the argument that key interest groups couldn't recognize the rise in deviance because doing so would force them to give up their jurisdiction over related problems and forsake opportunities and resources. The groups thus had an incentive, he argues, to minimize the seriousness of the behavior. When I first read this paper as a graduate student, I struggled, and I still struggle now, to understand what groups exactly he was talking about is it teachers, the welfare bureaucracy? Leaving that aside, this seems to be more a case of motivated reasoning than anything else. Groups committed to a broadly feminist agenda saw single parenthood one way, those not committed to such an agenda saw it differently, and the racialized aspects of the debate at the time meant that civil rights concerns were clearly in the mix too. Whether there was an oversupply of deviance uh, wasn't particularly relevant. Imagine there'd been half as many single mothers. Would left-leading institutions in that scenario be any more inclined to treat the behavior as deviant? Certainly not. All this is to say that there's some real logical slipperiness in Moynihan's analysis. Now, in a previous version of this paper that I sent to Sally and Steve, I moved on at this point to consider whether you could layer Moynihan's defining deviancy down thesis onto existing sociological and social psychological theories of norm operation, uh, emergence, and change. Moynihan glosses his argument as being about deviance, but in the social sciences, you really can't speak about deviance without also talking about norms, since a deviant act is simply defined as one that violates a prevailing norm. My conclusion was that you have to do a lot of theory building work uh, for that layering to uh, be effective. This isn't a graduate seminar in sociological theory though, so it makes sense to put those questions to one side. And Sally asked instead that I consider whether defining deviancy down applies to any contemporary developments with respect to crime and justice. To this question, I would say it does and it doesn't. If by defining deviancy down, we mean that some behavior previously seen as violating a social norm is no longer understood to do so, or that we no longer attach as strong social sanctions to those norm violations, then clearly, yes, some behaviors once seen as criminal are now no longer defined as such. Smoking or selling marijuana, panhandling or pitching a tent on a sidewalk, in some states, concealed carry, Criminal laws have changed around each of these behaviors, and for some, though not all, uh, public opinion has changed as well. For example, according to the General Social Survey in 1973, 19% of Americans said that marijuana should be legal. In 2018, the last time that question was asked on the GSS, uh, support for legalization had risen to 59%. We're also seeing reduced penalties for certain offenses, from pressure to end three strikes uh, and your out provisions that sentence career criminals to life in prison, to policies in cities like Philadelphia that prohibit the police from stopping cars for minor infractions, such as missing brake lights, um, effectively decriminalizing vehicles, uh, driving with an unsafe vehicle. 
But if this is all we mean by Moynihan's thesis, then it means very little. Norms and laws pertaining to crime and punishment are constantly changing. That's part of living in a dynamic modern society, particularly ones like ours with highly decentralized criminal justice systems. Sometimes our laws get less strict, as in the examples I just gave, and sometimes they get more strict, as in the proliferation of hate crimes laws or laws to do with human trafficking. I have the sense, the strong sense, that often when people invoke defining deviancy down, what they really mean is, I think we've been getting too lenient around behavior X, and we should go back to the way things were before. Or, we really should be devoting more energy or resources to fighting X. Those may be perfectly reasonable claims to make, depending, of course, on what the X is, but they're value judgments. They're not social science, and we shouldn't pretend otherwise. If we focus in on the causal sequence that Moynihan claimed to identify, where more crime than we have the capacity to handle leads us to change our views of what's deviant, I don't see many contemporary examples of that. When homicide spiked in 2020 and 2021, we may not have reacted to it as some people would have liked, with huge increases in violence prevention and policing resources. But it's not as though authorities ignored the problem, and it's not as though people living in the communities affected um, reached the conclusion that homicide was now any less wrong. Moynihan makes the mistake of inferring from the fact of rising or persistently high crime rates that people in affected communities are now somehow more accepting of criminal behavior. But crime trends are driven by a whole range of factors, most having little to do with those kinds of broad-scale shifts in the content of norms. Now, norms do matter when it comes to crime. The work of the criminologist Rob Sampson shows that an enabling condition for crime increases is people in neighborhoods losing the collective capacity to exercise uh, informal social control over teenage boys and young men. This can happen when the structural conditions of neighborhoods shift, a growth in the number of renters relative to long-term homeowners, for example, uh, which makes it so that neighbors no longer know one another well enough to feel comfortable yelling at each other's kids. But here, it's not that the content of norms changed. Sampson found in looking at uh, high crime neighborhoods in Chicago that the people there were as upset about crime as anyone else. They subscribed to the same norms as they had before. It was that their ability to sanction norm violations had been compromised. And to briefly resort to the language of the sociologist James Coleman, the demand for the norm remained the same. Uh, norms proscribing criminal behavior continue to serve important functions for the community but the social conditions were no longer present for those norms to be effectively realized. This isn't defining deviancy down so much as normative impotence. More generally, most of the normative changes I've seen recently around crime and criminal justice, such as increasing tolerance of recreational drug use or greater leniency toward juvenile offenders or decreasing acceptance of police use of force, stem not from society being unable to afford to recognize the amount of deviance, but from the many and varied factors that we know can bring about normative change in any context, from intergenerational dynamics to political mobilization to collective experimentation and social learning. Also, it's not always clear how we should understand up or down when it comes to crime. For example, if we scale back mass incarceration and as part of that reduce prison terms in excess of 20 years, are we defining criminal deviancy down if we then turn around and use that money that we save uh, for more policing? If we become less accepting of police use of force, is that us becoming more tolerant of criminals or less tolerant of what we now see as criminality by agents of the state? The senator from New York was absolutely right that sometimes societies define deviancy down in the sense of taking the behavior once seen as deviant and reclassifying it so that it is no longer viewed in that way. As a name for such a reclassification, defining deviancy down works well enough but it's a sociological commonplace. As a theory about the conditions under which this occurs, however, or of the process by which it occurs, defining deviancy down, the essay, um, is pretty weak tea. Thanks. Thank you, and also thank you, Glenn. That was just a wonderful talk. So I, I got the feeling if we questioned everyone here, they'd kind of know where they were at the time they read Defining Deviancy Down, kind of like where you were when the Challenger exploded. Um, I'll get to 
I'll get to where my light bulb memory is. But uh, for, for right now, I'll start by saying that, um, you know, uh, Moyn Senator Moynihan's uh, powerful point that the moral deregulation, this is his words, the moral deregulation of the 60s led to an explosion of deviancy in family life, criminal behavior, and publicly displayed psychosis. Uh, in short, he said, quote, we're getting used to a lot of behavior that is not good for us. And I think that, that was definitely uh, a well-taken point and still is. Of course, it raises the question of how it is that we became used to it. And his thesis, which I'm skeptical of, of also, um, is that there's somehow a fixed quota of, of deviancy in a, in a society. And if we uh, can't accommodate it all, then we have to be in denial about some of it. So um, since I'm a psychiatrist, I'm going to talk about this phenomenon from uh, men the standpoint of mental health and substance abuse. I smuggled in substance abuse because it's technically a mental disorder <laughs> in the DSM. Um, although Moynihan didn't really talk about it. And if he did, he probably put it into the context of, you know, of crime. Um, but I'm interested in whether efforts to recalibrate deviancy over time um, have made some situations worse and some situations better. Uh, but first, some criticism. Uh, I should say almost as a dis disclaimer that, um, uh, not to seem too sensitive about this, but I don't consider, and I'm sure Moynihan didn't either, but the, the sort of the symptoms of severe mental illness to be a sign of deviancy. Um, psychosis is, of course, an involuntary state, and, um, and deviancy is willful misbehavior. So. Um, so that's one point I wanted to mention. Um, and second, even if uh, in any sense, I don't think his model works that well for um, mental illness. As, as Neil actually alluded to, there are many reasons why we tolerate, um, well, that's another question. Who's the we, as, as you also brought up? But um, the toleration of, of severe mental illness during the a, a period of deinstitutionalization, which started in the very late 50s, early 60s. Um, it didn't happen because there was an increase in the number of mentally ill individuals. And I'm referring to people with schizophrenia, bipolar, and less very severe, usually psychotic conditions. Um, they weren't more, there wasn't a burst of them uh, in, from an epidemi epidemiologic standpoint at that, at that time. Um, even though it is true that many of the state facilities were overcrowded. But it happened for the following reasons, um, about four major reasons. One is that there were a, continu um, a continuous drumbeat of con very bad conditions being exposed in these facilities. Um, investigative journalists um, who wrote reports and, and showed very, very disturbing pictures, the most, um, probably the dominant ones, was published in 1948 by Albert Deutsch called the, Sh the Shame of the States. And he really revealed the conditions of many of these institutions across the country. Also at the time, there was pharmacological um, development, which would have um, allowed, they were antipsychotic medications and could have allowed some individuals to live on their own in the community. And that was true. There was a big patients' rights uh, push towards community um, treatment and against asylums. Um, also, states saved a lot of money by tearing down or at least depopulating their state facilities. And if, if the treatment was supposed to be moved into the community as the 1963 C Community Mental Health Services Act had um, uh, provided for or Hopefully, provided for it actually didn't, but um, but the idea was that the states could could share the expense with Medicaid, and that would save not having to um, finance these big facilities would have saved the states a lot of money. So there are very practical um, reasons, not many of them even that ideological, for why we why institutionalization started. The problem was that the community's mental health infrastructure that was supposedly designed by that legislation I just mentioned, um, signed by JFK. Um, in fact, he signed it 60 years ago tomorrow. 
um, October 31st, 1963, um, that uh, the Community Mental Health Services Act did not create the kind of mental health infrastructure that was needed, uh, neither in terms of volume, there weren't enough outpatient clinics, and also in terms of the philosophy of treatment. Um, uh, unfortunately, so many of the uh, psychiatrists running these facilities believed that if we fixed social conditions, we would cure our severe mental illness. It hasn't worked out well, and we still, to this day, have so many severely mentally ill people uh, languishing on streets and in jail cells. Uh, some people did well with uh, moving to the community, but too many didn't. So in this case, as you kind of alluded to before, um, Neil, kind of defining deviancy down, if anything, had more to do with what politicians could tolerate. Um, the Swiss cheese safety nets, no long-term beds. Um, now, to be fair, a lot of people did not accept it out of concerns for both the individuals who were sick and for the, the safety of the city. But we're still struggling with long-term debates over civil liberties and um, civil commitment and voluntary treatment. So, um, so as you say, and as, as Glenn mentioned also, it's sometimes worth considering the distinction between the kinds of deviancy that the public is uh, prepared to live with versus the kind of deviancy that the leaders or the definers are prepared to deal with and worse, impose on the rest of us. Luckily, we've seen some movement uh, with respect to the encampment situations in New York. Um, Mayor Adams has an, a program that's been up and running for um, almost a year, and Mayor Newsom in um, LA is about to implement one. These are exercises in what I call benign paternalism, and they're devoted towards people who, for reasons of severe mental illness and or addiction, but mostly severe mental illness probably, and severe mental illness plus addiction, uh, would be defined as gravely disabled. That is, they really can't take care of themselves and they're in danger because of self-neglect. At the same time, there are norms in the mental health sphere that have changed, I would say, in the right direction. Um, uh, conditions that were considered shameful or embarrassing in the past are now largely accepted. Um, people coming forward, uh, for example, like telling employers about mental health problems, so they need time off or some kind of temporary disability. Um, people talking a little more openly about their distress, and there is uh, you know, a lot to be gained by understanding that See, other people suffer from this too and getting support that way. Um, I haven't done a content analysis of memoirs, but uh, I mean, there seems to be an explosion of memoirs about mental um, health, mental illness. Uh, people have a lower threshold now, I think, for getting treatment. And the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was implemented just the year before Defining Deviancy Down essay was published, was you know, a very important um, legislation. So I'll bring in substance abuse here, where I think we have made, and I'll use the term even, moral progress there. Um, I don't consider mental health legalization, I mean, a me a marijuana legalization necessarily moral progress, although some people do, and that certainly, though, fits into defining deviancy um, down, but in a, I would say, in a, in a constructive way if we regulate it properly. I realize that's a very complicated topic, um, but, but more... Um, in a way more seriously when it comes to people's uh, health. We have needle exchange. Um, we have Narcan, which is the reversal agent for opioid overdose. We um, are giving out fentanyl test strips. I mean, who would have imagined years ago that we would give out devices for people not to kill themselves with drugs? Um, we have, um, in the criminal justice system, we have drug courts, which did start in 1989 before the... Um, before the essay was written, but they hadn't really taken off until later. That drug diversion, excuse me, um, drug courts are jail diversion mechanism for people who've committed crime but are addicted to drugs. And finally, we have ads for HIV AIDS on TV. I mean, who would have imagined such a thing quite a while ago? So these are, I would say, good developments. Um, but bad developments <laughs> as a result of the normalization that comes along with defining deviancy down are on the streets of San Francisco, LA, Kensington outside of Philadelphia, Portland, and referring obviously to encampments of people with severe mental illness 
and substance abuse. Um, you know, there's open air drug use, open air drug markets, um, public defecation, people preying on each other, um, and people being preyed on, compromising civic safety and the integrity of businesses. Um, and many of these folks uh, refuse treatment or, or if they accept shelters, they don't stay very long. On the other hand, there's a demand um, for to give apartments to people who are still too drug involved to be responsible occupants. Sometimes there are drug sales in some of these facilities. And also attitudes and, and solicitation um, that include provision of drug paraphernalia that, you know, while sterile, um, will undermine people's interest in, frankly, becoming more autonomous and in, I would say, suppressing their potential for flourishing. There is um, there's a, a, an activist named uh, Kevin Dahlgren. He has a, um, he has a substack, and he lives in Portland, and he helps... He helps folks who are in, who are in encampments. And um, he, a few years ago, he was uh, paying special attention to this man who had basically set up camp inside a, a doorway of an abandoned building. And, um, and every day he'd go there and bring him food and water and other things. But Kevin went on vacation for about, two, about a week. And when he came to see this man, um, after that time... Uh, the guy was dehydrated and practically starving, and and he said, "What? What? What? What's the matter with you? You know, why didn't you uh, go out or you know stand at the outside of your in little encampment and tell the advocate, the other advocates, that you were hungry?" He said, "Well, you know, I was waiting for you to come. I mean, that is a malignant kind of dependency that we can we're often, um, unfortunately, instilling in folks." So let me go back now to mental health and say, I think there are other troubling attempts at normalizing and destigmatizing. And this has to do with young people. Um, on TikTok, you can apparently uh, develop Tourette's by contagion. Um, you can perfect your skills as an anorectic. Uh, you can see horrible examples of self-cutting. Uh, these are now granted they're not accepted by the parents of these children, but um, but among teens th within their little subculture, this is definitely defined down. Whether it's a means of bonding, a way to get attention, developing an identity, I'm sure it varies from person to person. But that's not a healthy development. So those are some of my thoughts on defining deviancy down in um, mental health. Uh, a I want to quickly talk about um, the way that I became available. I, I became aware of the Defining Deviancy Down es essay, and that was through Daniel Patch. Uh, excuse me, Charles Krauthammer, who was a psychiatrist and a columnist for the Washington Post for years, and he published an essay. I saw his essay before I knew about Daniel Patrick Moynihan's essay. His essay was called Defining Deviancy Up. And, um, and he talked about um, moral upregulation. One of the most obvious being we can't even use the word deviant now. Um, that, that really would be very offensive um, to, to some folks. Uh, and um, he started with, if you recall, the Water Buffalo case in 1993, where someone lit, you know, cursed outside of a window at the University of Pennsylvania because people were making noise. And he used, he was, this was a, um, a Jewish student, a very observant Jewish student, so he used a Yiddish word um, that kind of translated into water buffalo, although it's a very, in fact, um, Kronham was so funny, he said, they, they should have asked me. It's, of course, it's a common term. My father called me that all the time. But um, anyway, but this was almost the beginning, it seems, of the political, at least, at least the public, I think, awareness, how political correctness sort of erupted into public consciousness. And Krauthammer also went on in that essay to talk about date rape. And other, again, lowering the threshold that things that really were not so um, outrageous were now being catapulted into the category of shameful. And now we have microaggressions and trigger, trigger warnings and safe spaces and um, having to hand in a paper late because something upsetting happened. Um, you know, all, all adding to the fragility and the presumption of fragility of, of young people. Um, my own experience, 
recently I gave a talk about addiction to a group of medical um, folks, and I mentioned the dimension of agency in addiction, and they got extremely offended because of that. In my own field, again, of addiction, now there's, it's kind of clever, I have to say, but an addictionary um, that uh, kind of is a little language policing about how to talk about, how to talk about addiction. Um, and, but, and it's all well-meaning. So much of this is well-meaning. Uh, but when you don't want to accept that kind of language, and I usually don't, then you become the deviant. And, and one, finally, one other big example in defining deviancy up is trauma. Um, we've medicalized normal human reactions to distressing events and pathologized it. Real trauma is, is a serious thing, but unfortunately, we've raised the bar on what trauma is. And I've seen that play out in a very destructive way when I worked at the VA um, uh, health centers because when people magnify their disability, and when we, suggest, we as physicians suggest it to them, because a lot of them are very, in a very fragile state, but instead of suggesting resilience and improvement, we suggest, gee, maybe you should apply for disability. And then they're in a cycle of, of invalidism, and they don't work, and the whole um, universe of productivity and work is close to them. So it can be very destructive. So I'm going to wrap up now by saying um, that uh, I think even though we found a lot of some faults with the essay, that uh, it's certainly an important heuristic and raises a lot of interesting questions, such as why do some things get normalized and some things become the subject of outrage and repression? I'm not sure the quota theory works, um, but, uh, but it is interesting that um, defining deviancy up, Kay and I were talking about this yesterday, defining deviancy up and its counterpart, defining deviancy down, kind of a hydraulic relationship, it seems, um, always seem to emanate from, from the left uh, to take the pressure off marginalized groups, to liberate them, to create new protected victim status, and to control others. And I was saying to Kay how, but I, I don't, can't think of examples. I mean, please tell me, audience, when we're up for Q&A, but I really can't think of too many examples of, of these uh, phenomena emanating from the right. But she reminded me about Trump, so, <laughs> which I thought was a great point. So I'm going to wrap up by saying that, um, that um, I'm going to, I'll hurry up because I have a feeling I'm over time, but you know, we have, we have an ideological push. You know, one of the mechanisms behind this, well, some ideological, again, with the, in the context of mental health and substance abuse, um, pushing civil liberties, and I'm thinking again of, again, some of these homeless encampments, the notion that a moral society is a tolerant society, reframing things, you're not mentally ill, you just need housing, or your problem is you live in a capitalist society. I'm serious. Um, another is that we put conventional standard bearers on the defensive. Uh, you become the intolerant one if you complain about human feces on a sidewalk. You know, fill in the blank. But this is turned against people, and I think Glenn uh, alluded to that as well. Uh, we can kind of cultivate new constituents, which advocates like a lot. You think of yourself as if you, you know, someone's suffering from severe schizophrenia, no, you're not. You're neurodiverse, or this is a lifestyle choice. If you're a trial lawyer, you can recruit new victims, um, and that's very good for the plaintiff's bar. And also, from the standpoint of uh, pharmacology and drug, <laughs> some drug companies, you know, if we create some new illnesses, uh, if we normalize some stress and consider it pathologic, you know, we have a drug to sell you. <clears throat> so I'll end with the, just this observation that there's a strange paradox going on, I think. You know, one is so much of defining deviancy up and down seems to be trying to change the social order, and yet I think it also belies a kind of frustration and helplessness. Like, we can't solve these problems, so we'll just reorient them, you know, on the chessboard of what's acceptable and what isn't. Thanks so much. Okay. I was told that I could trip, so I'm going to do that. Um, I want to um, thank Sally for arranging this uh, event 
um, I'm always happy to come to AI. Uh, it's my second favorite center-right think tank. So uh, happy to be here. And I'm also happy to be talking about Daniel and Patrick Moynihan. Um, it was, uh, to my thinking, one of the top minds in, to ever serve in the United States Congress, though admit, I admit at this point that doesn't look like much of a uh, bar to reach. Um, I was a little alarmed when I first heard Glenn talking so much about the Moynihan Report, the Negro, uh, the, uh, Negro family, um, because that was my, uh, <laughs> going to be the bulk of my comments. But um, I'm going to try to edit as I go along and just add some new thoughts to that, uh, to some of what he said, um, and take us in a slightly different direction. Um, remember, though, this report um, was um, probably uh, much more famous, still, I think, more famous than the um, Defining Deviancy Down. Uh, it was written in 1965. The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. Uh, uh, Moynihan was only about 38 years old, a relatively obscure Assistant Secretary of Labor, not remotely a household name, which is um, something that he was about to correct by writing The Negro Family. Um, the, uh, again, to go through just the main points that he made there so that I can comment on those. He delineated, delineated two alarming trends um, in the black population at the time. The first was a notable rise in single mother households, which was mirrored by a similar uptick in non-marital, or what was called at the time, illegitimate births. Second trend was a decline in black male unemployment. Uh, and that divergence, which eventually uh, was called um, Moynihan's scissors, caught uh, Moynihan's high eye, and for good reason. In the past, as more black men joined the workforce, welfare roles would shrink, indicating that more men were earning money and able to provide for their families. Uh, this is a time, obviously, where uh, women were much, mothers in particular, were much less likely to be working particularly mothers of uh, young children. Uh, and uh, they relied on their husbands for, for the money that would support the family. Um, now, uh, as Moynihan looked at these numbers, it seemed like a growing number of lower income black women. Moynihan was careful to acknowledge, by the way, that there, this was, did not apply to a growing black middle class. Some people sometimes forget that. He made a special point of it. Were, uh, but a growing number of uh, lower income black women were having their children outside of marriage. Instead of relying on husbands to support them and their kids, they were turning to welfare. Um, and that was a major concern uh, and a major uh, uh, piece, the theme in the uh, original report. Uh, he didn't use the term deviance to describe the growing population of single mother, single welfare-dependent mothers' households, but there's no question that he viewed it that way. And the truth is a vast majority of Americans would have agreed with him, probably. The United States had for some time what he called a recognizable family system. That is, there was a norm, um, a normative way of forming families. He's referring, of course, to the nuclear family, a household including a mother, a father, uh, and their children. And this just wasn't just a leave it to beaver kind of fantasy. In 1965, when Moynihan wrote his uh, report on the Negro family, three quarters of all households consisted of married couples and um, uh, of married couples and their children. Only 3% of white households with children were missing a husband or father. In other words, that, that was uh, very, very rare, uh, though it was not so much um, for, uh, for uh, black, women, uh, black families. Now, the harsh treatment that uh, those who failed to conform to this dominant family system reflected how seriously Americans and this was true, by the way, for all societies at the time, 
uh, took this particular form of deviance. They uh, were single mothers were always a major problem for societies uh, for the obvious reason that they were much more vulnerable to, uh, to outside violence to, and, and, and much more vulnerable to starvation and poverty and various other ills. Um, but the uh, harsh treatment at the time in this society, in American society and most Western societies, was um, fairly um, benign when you think about compared to uh, places where they put uh, girls for as young as 10 in Deperta or, you know, and uh, they were uh, essentially engaged to a much older man uh, by their parents and, and forced to stay home for the next five years till they were uh, going into puberty. So what, what in this society, most Western societies, it was still very difficult for women who became pregnant when they were unmarried. Non-marital births were referred to as illegitimate. Um, the children were not uncommonly known as bastards. Younger women who um, got pregnant were put into homes for wayward girls. Um, but the most, uh, perhaps the most benign effort to control the um, uh, growth of single motherhood was shotgun marriages. Um, this was a kind of social device for trying to keep the number of um, illeg illegitimate children, uh, non-marital children, to um, uh, 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 workable levels. Uh, there's a very famous paper by George Akerlof and Janet Yellen uh, from 1996, just a few years after Moynihan published um, Defining Deviancy Down. Um, uh, they said that nearly 60% of first, first births among white women uh, and a quarter of first babies among black women were conceived outside of marriage. Um, that is, the babies were, were uh, born less than, uh, uh, less than nine months after the wedding bells rang. These marriages, by the way, these shotgun marriages, um, were often long-lived, uh, and perhaps many of them were happy. We don't have any data on that. But um, it, it, there's no question that shotgun marriage was a, was a kinder and gentler way to keep a single mother deviance under control. Now, these methods of social control were clearly losing their hold on black communities by the uh, early 1960s. Um, it's, I think it's important to notice before I move on that these the methods that I talked about were not bureaucratic, they were not even governmental, they were social. It was a social consensus uh, that the, um, having a child outside of marriage was a, um, I don't think people would have put it this way, but this is why it was there, was a danger to the community. Um, when Moynihan wrote his report, 24% uh, of black children were born to unmarried women. Um, the number was highest in the Northeast and in New York City, um, uh, for instance, 30% of households with children with husbands were absent. And absent, and that didn't even include divorced families. Um, Moynihan found these numbers alarmingly devi deviant, as did many of those in government uh, and policy circles. President Johnson even gave a major speech echoing Moynihan's warning, notably at Howard University. Um, they, the people who were worried or agreed with uh, Moynihan couldn't have known just how much the numbers were about to skyrocket. And I think Glenn talked about some of these, but I'll just mention that 15 years after uh, the Negro family, the out of wedlock birth rate among blacks had more than doubled. Um, and reached more than half, 56%. By 1980s, um, the illegitimacy was um, started to, uh, uh, that word started to disappear from common parlance, but it had spread to white and Hispanic populations. 34% of Hispanics 
Um, uh, the non-marital birth rate was 34% for Hispanics in 1990. It rose to 50% by 2016. The rate among whites, especially among the working class, took off in the 80s as well. And today, uh, the um, out-of-wedlock birth rate hovers around uh, 40% of all births, so hardly deviant. Um, so how should we understand what happened here? Um, 28 years after Moynihan wrote his uh, infamous report, he came up with an answer when he listed unmarried parenthood as a prime example of defining deviancy down. And uh, Neil uh, mentioned he specifically called it an example of the opportunistic redefinition of deviancy. In this telling, there's a wide spe uh, spectrum of interest groups, as he put it, uh, in federal and municipal governments um, who uh, included uh, uh, workers in uh, the welfare system, AFDC at the time, had the Head Start bureaucracy and such. Uh, and they all had, these uh, people working in these areas all had a benefit in turning, in, in normalizing single motherhood. Their livelihoods depended on it. Um, because children of single mothers were becoming a problem for schools where they were often in need of special education, and if you look at the percentage of kids in special ed, uh, 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 largely disproportionate number of them are uh, the children of, of single mothers. Um, it, because that was the case, Moynihan also included educators as, those, as uh, some of those who were controlling some of the deviant population, supposed called deviant populations. As he pointed out, there's good money to be made from bad schools. Now, it, it, the numbers make it clear that single motherhood could not be called deviant anymore. And as Sally mentioned, it's, it's a word that itself has lost legitimacy. Um, and certainly, as uh, Moynihan pointed out, there's little evidence that uh, many people, and, and especially government, regarded this as a calamity. Uh, to the contrary, there is a general acceptance, he points out, of the situation as normal. Still, I think that um, Moynihan was on the wrong track here. To understand in, uh, the explosion of single parent families, he would have been better off returning to the controversy that had hounded his earlier report into near oblivion. That controversy suggests that there were many other interest, others interested in defining this sort of deviancy downward, if that's what was happening, to use more or less to use more contemporary language, or they were interested in no longer stigmatizing single mother families. There were two groups in particular who were most alarmed at Moynihan's argument about the danger in the rise um, in um, uh, single parent families. First, as, as Glenn talked about, there were civil rights leaders uh, they saw in Moynihan's argument a threat to the progress that had been made by their movement. They viewed it as a way of turning the discussion away from discrimination and mistreatment, a discussion which was paying off with legislation like the Voting Rights Act, which was passed in the same year as um, the, the Moynihan report. Um, to cite only one of many examples, Floyd McKissick, director of the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, he uh, uh, scolded that rather than the family, it's the damn system that needs changing. Another influential critique came from a prominent civil rights activist, a psychologist named William Ryan, who invented the now familiar phrase, blaming the victim, to describe the report. But that was only one group. Uh, who were very, very uneasy about this focus on single, the, uh, single motherhood as a problem. Second wave feminists were the other group dismissive of it. Uh, they believed that marriage was the main arena of male privilege, uh, and at least some of the more radical feminists celebrated the single black mother as a strong black woman who, because she had always had to work. 
And the second wave feminists were very focused on the, the um, fact that women were not in the workforce in large enough numbers. So this was a major issue for them. <coughs> Um, in, the, in the more radical version described by Charles Krauthammer in the lecture that uh, um, Sally just described, um, it's not enough for the deviant to be normalized. He wrote, the normal must be found to be deviant. I don't know, is this mine? Yeah. Um, feminists, at least the more radical ones that led Betty Friedan to eventually splinter the feminist uh, uh, movement, Marriage was designed to oppress women. It's a cauldron of pathology, a teeming source of depressions, alienation, and violence towards women and children. And this was more widely accepted than you might think. The most surprising example came from um, a, a concurring assent in a 1977 Supreme Court decision, Moore versus City of uh, East Cleveland, excuse me a minute. This case concerned a woman and her grandson evicted from a housing project following a city ordinance that defined family as parents and their own children. Relying on a social scientist um, who uh, was writing about uh, uh, the Moynihan Report, uh, the Supreme Court Justice William Brennan asserted that the extended family has many strengths not shared by the nuclear family. Uh, he declared that delinquency, addiction, crime, quote, neurotic disabilities, and mental illness were more prevalent in societies where, quote, autonomous nuclear families prevail. But I think that uh, Moynihan was wrong here. Def Defining, deviancy wasn't simply defined down by the interest group he mentioned. He neglected the fact that it was only one in an interlocking group of what have been described deviancies in the past, which were now becoming acceptable. I'm thinking of premarital sex, cohabitation of unmarried couples, no-fault divorce, mm -hmm. uh, which some believe was the cause of, of an explosion of divorce divorces that uh, occurred in the 1980s. Uh, there was also teen pregnancy. Uh, these things were being, um, were all part of a, of a web of, of uh, social change. Uh, and I think to separate single motherhood from all of these is to not fully understand what was going on at the time. Um, they were part of a, a loosening of norms, and I agree with Neil that this is a term that's missing from defining deviancy down. Um, and it was a, a loosening of norms that was enabled by reproductive technology. Uh, interestingly, that echoes the uh, example of the deinstitutionalization that was also enabled by pharmacology. So. Uh, the uh, reproductive technology, of course, would include um, safe abortion uh, and mostly the pill and other forms of, of uh, advanced uh, tech, uh, uh, birth control. Premarital sex, for instance, no longer needed to be stigmatized to be defined as a deviant since the likelihood of pregnancy was so reduced. Um, norms of this sort were not defined down exactly. They were reimagined, and they were now considered oppressive to in, uh, individual flourishing and decision making. I think you saw something similar happen uh, to the uh, understanding of the meaning of marriage, uh, as an, it became more of an arena for self expression and self fulfillment rather than a social arrangement for rearing the next generation, creating new families, and expanding kinship ties. So uh, all of this, I think, all of these changes were uh, part of, like I said, an interlocking uh, group of, of change, of uh, new norms, uh, which are with us today. Um, I'll end by saying that deviance is a behavior that violates social norms. 
by the late 1960s and today still, those norms are a matter of, of strong disagreement. Thanks. So before we take questions from the floor, I just want to throw a couple of things out there based on the presentations. Um, and one is, um, again, because I want to insist on going back to the actual article and not just whether we think that there's lots of bad public policy out there, right? That is, if we just said, oh, that you know, the deinstitutionalization, deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill and, um, uh, you know, and loosening norms on uh, single mothers and, uh, and crime were all bad, right? That would not have been a very interesting essay, right? What makes this interesting is that there's a mechanism, right? Um, and I actually think in some ways maybe the mechanism is better than some of the panelists. I'm just going to ask a question of Neil. Um, one way to make the mechanism make sense in crime is to think about the phenomenon we know of enforcement swamping, right? Which is, you know, one, one problem is if, you know, if we have a lot of some particular crime that occurs, right, um, and the enforcement capacity doesn't change, then the people who are, in this case, the police, have to triage, right? That is, if we have a bunch of calls to serve for service, right, and they're more than they were before, obviously, mechanically, some things that were previously being treated as worth having a policeman come out to will simply not be able to because they have to send the police out for the more serious offense. Now, we do have a theory that says, well, that leads you into a cycle that eventually gets you into higher crime because they triage, then we stop enforcing on the lower level offense, and then we get more of the lower level uh, offense, and then, you're, and then you also have, a net, you have the phenomenon the other direction, right, which is when you actually get fewer offenses, then they can start prioritizing lower level offenses, and then you get more, so you get on either side. That does seem to sort of fit with the mechanism in this piece, right, which is that um, one thing we had is we had this sudden huge increase in the amount of crime in the 60s and 70s. The system did not immediately mechanically respond with more enforcement capacity. And then at the micro level, right, the, the people who were doing enforcement just had to actually triage, right? Um, does that mechanism actually seem consistent to you with what Moynihan's actually describing here? And in that sense, can we actually save some of the actual theory here? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting. Um, I, I mean, I suppose it depends, um, as I'm thinking about it, on the particular kind of um, criminal behavior you're talking about. I mean, um, uh, you know, so think about something like uh, an auto theft or even an auto burglary, like a break into a car. Um, so if you've got a city that um, you know, has a very high rate of violence and a super stretched police force, New Orleans, for example, it may be that those kinds of calls um, are, uh, will be ones that will just take the police a very, very long time to respond to, or they will um, uh, you know, send uh, civilians to, to take care of those reports or something like that. Now, the question is, um, in the process, do we as a society somehow think of auto break-ins or auto thefts as less serious, as less of a violation of you know, our, our sense of um, of, of personal property and, and security. Um, and I would guess that for something like that, if, if you ask the citizens of New Orleans, they probably feel as angry about it as they ever did. It's just that they feel that the cops can't adequately respond to it. So I don't see that as defining deviancy. Now, now it, it's true that um, you know, if, if uh, enough calls of a certain type aren't responded to and there's effectively no deterrence, then you might get a rise in that kind of criminal behavior, which would perhaps sort of force the hand of the cops and, or force the hands of, um, of people who allocate social control resources so that you have to have more police on the street. So I think it could change the amount of behavior, but as to whether it actually affects um, the amount of crime or not, it's, I, I think it's an open question. I'm watching this play out in real time. Maybe some of you are as well in my neighborhood in Park Slope, Brooklyn, where um, there's, no, there's not a lot of serious crime, but there has been a growing amount of disorder uh, and a lot more uh, disturbed people on the streets. And I uh, follow next door the, the uh, site, that uh, community site that people uh, write in various issues in the neighborhood. And um, I'm seeing all the time people saying, well, don't bother reporting it to the police because they won't do anything. 
uh, for things like uh, car theft or uh, catalytic converters in my neighbors. <laughs> Bigger problem, I think, at the moment. Uh, but, uh, or, or a guy who is ranting on the street and they said, there's nothing that can be done. And they're, they seem to be angry about it, some of them, but then other people will write in and say, check your privilege. You know, this is just, you know, you're, you're very lucky to have a car or, or something like that. So I think, um, you know, what's been interesting to me is to watch and see just how annoyed people will be, because it's a very liberal neighborhood. And I still can't imagine them voting in a way that might, that might cause uh, the police to be uh, reacting more harshly to this right. kind well, of thing. One way to take this is, I mean, one problem is whenever, and this gets a little bit to Neil's point too, right, is um, we really shouldn't ever use the word society. It's just too big, right? Um, in many cases, in the case that I was talking about before, we're actually talking about the reactions of the actual enforcement capacity. It's not that society has changed its norms, right? But mechanically, the people who are doing the enforcement only have so many resources, and then they have to triage them. And then it may, one theory is in the process of triaging, in order to justify that decision to themselves, they have to treat the thing that they then deprioritize as less morally um, uh, problematic because they have to tell a story to themselves about why their behavior is actually okay. I mean, one thing I wanted to get to Kay's point is just to go a little bit to this, to the actual sociological theory here, right? One argument is that punishment, and the thing he talks about is that punishment serves a ritualistic purpose, right? It's a thing done in public, right? That's why he uses the example of stocks, right? It's a thing people do. Um, because it's a way of enacting and, um, and you know, stating the community seriousness about a norm, right? That's the classic Durkheimian story, right? Now, that's a little bit of a thing you can't get away with in social science anymore because it's a little too functionalist, right? Um, in general, we're told not to do that in social science, although I hear there's a group of these neo-functionalists out there, um, so maybe, maybe it's back. Um, but one way to make the point is that we find the ritual of punishment, at least in some cases, no longer tolerable, right? We don't want to see it, right? We don't, we don't actually want to see the person in the stocks, or at least some particular people in the stocks anymore. And in particular, we don't want the, the professions in charge don't want to do it, right? So one mechanism we might have is my co-author David Dagan in my book Pri uh, Prison Break and my colleague at the Scan Center um, wrote a, uh, uh, some really important work on the uh, decline of the death penalty in Britain. And one of the big explanations is the legal profession just didn't want to do it anymore, right? They thought it was, they either thought it was immoral or they thought it was, um, it was just too idiosyncratic or uneven, and they just wouldn't do it anymore, right? And that one thing we might be talking about is not that society in general, right, has become more permissive, but that the instruments that we're looking at to do the enforcement, right, the actual specific people who would be breaking up a homeless in encampment or shaming a single mother, right, or whatever, that they don't want to do it. And that's a more specific um, uh, case. And I wonder whether what we're really seeing, I mean, I think Kay's underlying story is actually much more a story about a very, very small group of people that we would count on to do enforcement. And maybe also Sally's case, where the mentally ill are concerned, that, um, that they have lost their, in a way you might think, their taste to engage in punishment. So any thoughts on that? Well, remember, you know, the kind of punishment that single mothers went through was never, it was never a function of any, uh, of any government uh, uh, people. It was, it was always more the community's disapproval that, that made the difference. Um, well, there, I, should, I, I should take that back. I mean, you couldn't go to school if you were, if you had a child, um, for instance, so that's that's something. Um, right, but that's a really important one because yeah. that's an example yeah, of is. there's a it kind is. of micro cruelty, right? And again, in the case of the of the individual actor, right, it, it was cruel, even if Absolutely. it was if it was if it if it served some larger social function, which is another question. But nobody yeah. wants to do that job Absolutely. of being the one who tells Absolutely. a single mother she can't go to school. Absolutely, right? Yeah. Okay. 
I was just going to say, if Glenn wants to participate, yeah. any please do. Yeah, Glenn, any yeah. thoughts on that? Oh, I'm, I'm good in enjoying the conversation. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm going to cede my res my time to the to the audience. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've only got time for yeah. really one more, no. for two, maybe two. We can go quick... up. A, we can go a little okay. bit over. We can go over. Yeah. Okay. So um, and let us know who you uh, who you are and if you have an affiliation uh, in the back. Great. Hello. Um, my name is Isai Monero. I'm a current student at Biola University, so I'm long away from home, from Los Angeles. Um, so I, I live in Los Angeles, and I, I've like I've lived there my entire life. I live in close to downtown, maybe like five minutes away. So I've like seen firsthand how you know issues of crime, welfare, and mental health have really, really devastated the city I love so much. Um, so my biggest question is, um, well, this might be a little different, but um, does the example of everything that's happening in Los Angeles prove that perhaps maybe local government is simply ineffective at solving these issues and it might be better up to private institutions or non-governmental institutions to tackle these issues like churches and other charitable organizations? Thank you. you want to, anyone want to take that? I do have one response. I don't know if you saw the Wall Street Journal um, this weekend, but there was a, a short but powerful com column by Andy Kessler and, um, well, the short answer to your question is clearly local government is problematic in some situations. I, I, don't, I haven't thought enough about whether private um, entities could do be better or how. But, um, but if you look, um, there are often kind of laws that, if they were reversed, could make a difference. And I'll just give you the example that he gives for California. Um, apparently, in 2014, they passed Proposition 47. You may be very familiar with it. Its formal title is Criminal Sentences, Misdemeanor Penalties, and Initiative Statute. Anyway, under this um, proposition, the California Penal Code defines misdemeanor, uh, excuse me, defines shoplifting as a misdemeanor that involves stealing items valued at under $950. Change that. Um, and then he gives other examples about the, what the Supreme Court could do about temporary shelter defining um, the rights of cities to go in and, and basically um, clean these up. Um, clearly, you need alternatives. Every time you clean something up, it'll move somewhere else um, or come back. And that's why, uh, and that's a whole other question, but that's why Gavin Newsom moved in, you know, trying to do what it, Mayor Adams is doing. Yeah, just on that, though, I mean, Again, hating to come back to the actual article again, but the, I mean, on, on the, the case of like the shoplifting thing, and I've, I've noticed I was, I remember it, it wasn't that long ago, I was up at, uh, I guess, 14th and W, there's a CVS, right? And people were just, ran, just walking out, like without even noticing. There wasn't even that moment where you saw like somebody trying to be furtive, right? It was just walking out with stuff out of the CVS. When I go to the, the Metro now, people regularly jump. The turnstile, but again, without that, like, pause to look around, right? right? Now, some of that is, now, it's not clear to me that there was a lot of enforcement going on before, right? It wasn't like before in the metro, there were lots of people who were jumping out of that station and being like, hey, come back here, right? It just somehow everybody got the idea that you could get away with it, right? And then nobody cared, but it wasn't clear to me that we were doing that much enforcement before, right? The, the norm there seemed to be doing a lot of the work. The norm that you didn't walk out of CVS just openly, right? You know, you at least have to have the dignity to put the thing under your, your sweater, right? Um, I guess one, one, thing, one question is along these lines, Neil, do you have any thoughts about, right, whether these things would be a phenomenon, which it would seem to be before, right, of the fact that, um, you know, there's a change in enforcement or is it now that we had a change in what people consider to be normative, or at least that they, they believed would be enforced, right? What do you think is going isn't on that, here? Isn't that the nor uh, broken windows theory, that you, that you do have to enforce? Those? Well, except my claim is there wasn't that much enforcement going on before, right? Well, at least in, in well, some of these cases. But I thought that when they wrote the def um, broken windows, that the idea was that they were not enforcing things like j turnstile jumping. And then they started to do it. Well, let me see, Neil, do you have a thought mm -hmm. on this? Mm -hmm. So the way that I think about it, um, there's the, there's the, the incidence of the, of the behavior. So you know, how many people are, uh, are shoplifting? Uh, 
Uh, and then there are norms that might be held by the people in the, the group who might potentially shoplift or by the, you know, the, the larger society about whether shoplifting is a, a reasonable thing or not. There's the question of enforcement. Um, you know, I, I think that um, certainly one, one theme that's come up in several of the discussions here um, in terms of a criticism of Moynihan is, is in, in a sense, he's too Durkheimian. Um, although he's not in his other work, but you know, the assumption seems to be here that um, the reason that behaviors change, the reason that the incidence of behavior goes up or down is because the norms have shifted. And of course, that's one reason that, that, that behaviors shift, but behaviors shift for a whole variety of other reasons to do with material incentives or you know, risks of actual punishment. Um, uh, there can be a weird kind of behavioral cascades that do sort of speak to the, um, the, the, um, the broken windows argument, right? It, it could be that um, people don't really know what the norms are in their group, uh, but they see a bunch of other people uh, engaging in uh, a form of behavior, and then they infer, this is a one sort of theory of norms that exists, that they sort of infer incorrectly that, uh, that other people um, think that shoplifting is okay, and then that kind of emerges as the new norm. So, um, you know, I think that it's, it's I, I don't think that that exactly rescues the argument of, of Moynihan. I mean, I think that um, certainly there can be shifts in, um, in, in behavior, whether or not there's a, a corresponding shift in norms and whether or not the corresponding shift in norms um, uh, sort of plays a role at the front end or the back end of the, in, you know, behavioral cascades up or down is, is I think it's an empirical question. And what you're both, what you alluded to is this, you know, the web of forces on, are alleged, apparent, or phenotypic acceptance of something. Um, but getting below the <clears throat> surface, I mean, just to throw in another variable, is the quality of the, I'll just use the word deviant, but the quality of the deviant changes. Now cops, because I asked them, why don't you do something? Well, I asked them much nicer. But, um, <laughs> and they're scared. People carry weapons now. Um, you could get killed, you know, confronting a kid who jumps over the turnstile. So that's just another part of the whole dynamic. Do we, I think, time, time yeah, for one more right. question. Matt? Uh, Matthew Bolger within the Scannon Center. Uh, work with Steve a little bit, as well as uh, Neil is our, our new fellow as well. I, I had a question, especially as it relates to individuals who are engaged in antisocial behavior, who are homeless, suffering from mental illness or, or uh, substance abuse issues. Um, and it also is with the changing of, of what is acceptable. So having conversations with people about this recently, there's a variety of reasons as to why people feel as though the state should not take a stronger role in this issue. Uh, a lack of capacity in drug treatment, mental health sh shelters, violence that exists within these institutions, um, the belief that individuals should not be either compelled to attend those places or that if they should be compelled, there's, there's issues with rampant violence and drug abuse that exists within those places I guess I'm curious as to what you think in terms of the ability for the state to counter art, counteract or at these institutions that exist to counteract the argument that there is a role for coercion in forcing individuals to seek assistance or to be compelled to seek assistance, but that is not yet possible in a circumstance in which the majority of society doesn't support um, mandatory abstention from, from drug usage, from alcohol abuse, increased policing in these institutions to protect, uh, prevent acts of violence against individuals who are there, um, as well as just the general act of individuals who are homeless and who are not suffering from mental health issues or substance abuse issues to be forced off the street into a place where they can become uh, more independent and are able to flourish. Well, I would challenge the premise, one of the premises, which you said that um, most people or would be against this, what I call again, benign, benign paternalism, benign coercion. I don't think most people are against it. I, I, frankly, I should know the polls on that. Um, I do think, though, it's a very hard, um, uh, you know, it's, it's still very hard to commit people, partly because we don't have places for them, and that affects the actions. But the short answer, is yes, I think the state, I hate saying the state, <laughs> so bring it down to the level of the community, really, it sounds more benign and more, more, more caring. And, you know, asylum in the real sense of the word, which is, which is to rescue and to care. 
um, for people who are, who are so vulnerable. I think the average person is very sympathetic to that, but they like, on the other end, for there to be the real capacity for treating these folks humanely. And I think maybe that's what stays some of their hands, is like, well, yes, we should take them off the street, but you know, where the hell would they go? And jail is certainly not an option. And I mean, for some, probably it's a little safer, but it's certainly not, not an accepted, you know, I, I don't accept that as a, uh, um, you know, an official option for sure. So, um, did you want to? Oh. Yeah, I was just saying that one point of this is that one of the constraints may be um, not necessarily, you know, society's again, you know, willingness to you know, expand its enforcement capacity, uh, but some of it also just be that some of these are things that we have a hard time knowing how to do, right? So, one of the things I was thinking of Melissa Carney's book on the two parent. Privilege, and you know, which is a very strong book about why um, you know absence of two-parent families is a big problem. But then she gets to the chapter where she's like, you know, most of the things that we might do about this, we actually really don't have an actually rich set of things that we know would actually alter this outcome, right? So again, it is possible to think that this is a really important social outcome over which we don't know very much about how to do, you know to alter, right? In some cases, it's that we actually don't know how to build enforcement capacity at scale, right? Or at least we haven't figured out how to do enforcement capacity at scale, right? So one of the cases, and you know, we're all interested in sort of um, coerced abstinence, and that is a kind of strategy, right? Well, doing that at scale involves an enormous increase in state capacity, right? It's just logistically really, really hard to do, right? It's hard to get state agencies to, to actually do that. And one possible theory is if we can't, you know, if we either have a problem and then we really just don't know what to do about it, or we can't, we sort of know what to do with it, but we can't figure out how to do it at scale, then do we actually get normative adjustment, right? And I think Neil is suggesting, well, actually, maybe we don't, right? Maybe just we get persistent um, just distaste with how society is going, right? That's the kind of phenomenon we get is that people either that you know, that phenomenon goes into generalized trust or belief in government. So then people are just like, well, we have all these problems. Somebody ought to be doing something about it, but nobody seems to be doing it. And then we just get lower level system um, kind of, uh, you know, we get enemy maybe, um, maybe that just to keep on the, on the topic. Um, but that's a kind of phenomenon. And then what you get overall that, to some degree, when you get that at high enough, then you get sort of anti-system kind of politics, right? Where people are saying, well, all these people would actually, we could solve all these problems if somebody was just willing to do what needed to be done, right? And that, that creates kind of the conditions for authoritarianism, right? And that may be the mechanism through which things happen. So, all right, I think we are over time now. I want to thank everybody for attending this panel. And I want to thank Glenn for his, uh, his powerful insights at the beginning and all of our panelists. So. <laughs>